Welcome to LOA Today. I'm Walt Thiessen. With me today is abundance teacher and money coach, Jody Lynn Creighton. This is your daily dose of happy. We are so happy you decided to join us today. And Jody Lynn, our special guest, uh, Brittany Sandoval, who was supposed to join us today, is not feeling well. So uh, we're going to have yeah. to have her back another time. Um, so anyone who's checking us out through one of the many social media places where we live stream this, uh, that they're all saying it's it's about Brittany. Sorry, it's not about Brittany. We'll we'll have her another time. But this is going to be a mislabeled show for today. <laughs> That's right. And uh, we, we were talking before we got started. We we, we decided we're going to talk about something we actually never really talked about as a subject before here on the show. We're, we're going to talk about animals. Yeah. And we don't even have an agenda. I mean, we, we have no, there's no outline here. We, we don't really have anywhere to go with it in particular. But I'll tell you what, the first thought that comes to my mind is a, a phrase that was very popular when I was young. I, I don't know if it's still popular today, but the phrase was animals are people too. Mm. Yeah. I, I feel like that's true. I mean, there are some people look askance at that like, yeah, okay, you know, grow up. <laughs> but <laughs> that's, that really, I, they feel like people to me. I mean, do they feel like people to you? Yeah, maybe not so much people because you can't have the same kind of conversation you do sure. with people, yes. but you have a conversation with them. Like, I know my dog communicates with me mm -hmm. and, you know, I think there's other animals in nature. I mean, they have different nature than us sometimes, mm -hmm. but I think a lot, like a lot of times think of it like a a tiered system if you will you know a hierarchy and like people are here and then like animals are down here and yeah. i don't really believe that i, I always you know? I, I remember the first time sitting in a science class and, and hearing about the classification of animals and i'm thinking to myself where did they get this from <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> no, I, I mean i i would i remember I would speak as if it was true because, you know, I followed what the teachers taught me to, to believe, you know, so, but, but deep down inside, I was thinking, what? <laughs> yeah. What are you talking about here? Yeah. Yeah. I think that we have, you know, I'm stuck on this line. This actually just popped into my head because, um, like there's in this one case, like not in one case, but like on this one side, I have this deep love and respect for nature, animals, you know, all of those things. And then on the other side, I still eat meat. No, I wouldn't eat my, a dog and I definitely wouldn't eat a horse. You know, I know some countries they do mm -hmm. their delicacies and whatever. I think maybe if I grew up eating that stuff, then fine. Um, but but so there's like this weird dichotomy, I guess, between the two. Like, well, and I've heard people say that before. Well, if you respect animals so much, how could you eat them? And but but then, you know, the situation where we started with this conversation was this dog that was dropped off on my road. And like I live out in the country and it's the middle of winter, you know, minus 40, minus 50 degrees Celsius. And somebody left this poor dog mm. here. And, um, it was like, we would see it outside of our gate. We would see it like inside of our field. Like we have 140 acres or something. Like we have a lot of land. Mm -hmm. So we would see it like touring on our land and it's a big dog. Uh, like looks like a guardian dog, like a great Pyrenees. Um, so built for outdoor weather, but no, like nobody could get close to it. So, mm -hmm. you know, we talked to all the neighbors and stuff like that. And, um, and it's been really eye-opening dealing with this situation because of the amount of people who are surrendering their pets right now because they can't afford to keep them. And I acknowledge that things are tough for people and that that is a reality. And somebody dropped off this dog probably for that reason. They couldn't take care of her or whatever. And, um, you know, we're, we're trying to, you know, find her a home because we, we just not, are not equipped to – handle a dog like her. Um, and it, all of the shelters are full. So I think about, you know, oh. if we were to, if we were to domesticate all these animals that we don't treat as pets here right now in North America, like this problem that we're having with dogs and cats would be amplified like a million fold. 
mm-hmm. because then who's going to take care of the cat, the cows <laughs> and the goats yeah. and yeah, yeah. the pigs and, and all of these things. Um, but it's an interesting thought experiment because I live on both sides of the line where I eat meat. Um, and I also love animals, all of them. Like I was yeah. telling you before, we had a pig farm when I was a kid. Right. And right. We would like, we had, you know, litters of pigs all the time and you know whatever and there would always be a rent of the litter and that one would be my favorite and i'd play with it and love it and and i distinctly remember when i was a kid there was one rent that was really really small and was dying it just it's just the circle of life and i was like daddy and he's like this is how it goes kid like there's nothing we can do for him he's just he's too small and you know he won't suck and you know, we can't, we can't do anything for him more than what we've already done. And like, it just broke my heart mm. to see that. Yeah. Life sucks when you can't suffer. <laughs> it's just, right. It's yeah. 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 It's just a hard, it's a hard relationship. Mm-hmm. And, and for those people who make the point, as you said earlier, yeah, well, if you love them so much, how can you eat them? Of course, I can flip the question around. They, they love us, too. If they love us so much, how could they eat us? And yet there are some of them that have no trouble doing that. So, you know, again, it's a life thing. You know, it, 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 it's yeah. not like it's all one directional. I'm not saying that man is the number one predator on Earth. Man is the number one predator on Earth. I'm just saying, you know, we get a little balance in, in the perspective here. But well, also- and I mean, if we didn't have all of the bells and whistles we have in our modern yeah. economies today, if all of those things shut down, I don't think we'd be the number one predator anymore. No. <laughs> like no. a lot of people couldn't fend for themselves in the, the forest. Yeah. You know? Yeah. yeah. If it was truly in the wild, if, it, if everything yeah, was yeah. level one survival, um, yeah. which it isn't for most people today. No, it I isn't. Um, but I'll tell you what my own perspective shifted even more as I became aware of the kind of spiritual and energetic and emotional belief systems we talk about a lot here on the program, because part of that is my belief, I think shared by many of us, that all of existence is alive, that there, that, that energy is existence, that energy is life, and that um, it's in everything. Everything has energy and everything's made of energy. It's basic basic theory of relativity. Um, yeah. That energy that, that drives everything, to me, just takes it to the next level because whereas before I really did feel, well, you know, cats are people too, dogs are people too. I felt that. I feel that even more now mm-hmm. because for me, people is consciousness. Yeah. People is awareness, self-awareness and awareness. Mm-hmm. Engagement in this 3D world. Well, Mm -hmm. okay, then that means that, well, not just the cats and the dogs, everything's alive, but especially the cats and the dogs. Yeah. And and I mean, I've got my buddy sitting in my lap right now as we're doing this uh, recording. And all I think to myself is he is completely his own personality. Just completely his own personality. I mean, I've never even known a cat like him, let alone a human being. Mm -hmm. He is so uniquely him that I can't imagine encountering another being like him. And with all of his quirks, he has personality quirks. He, he's, he, he's actually a little dysfunctional, <laughs> which, all, which makes him human as well, because there's so much dysfunctionality among humans. Uh, literally, for instance, just to give you an example, um, he'll be hungry, right? And he'll signal to me that he's hungry, but he won't go to the kitchen where the food is. We have to go through this dance before he'll finally go to the kitchen. But we have to yeah. go through this whole dance. I give him attention. I give him pets. He rubs up against me. And then we go to another place. We do the same. We have to go through this whole routine before he'll finally go to the kitchen. And then even then, when I'm feeding him, I'll put the food down. He's literally standing two feet away from it, his tail shaking in excitement, and he won't go up to get to the food. I have to invite him over to the food and, and assure him it's okay to go get the food. <laughs> <You're> totally dysfunctional. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> oh, what a cat. Yeah. But you know, you, you encounter an animal like that and you say to yourself, how do you come to the conclusion that they're not self-aware? How do you come to the conclusion that they're not a self-identity? 
How do you come mm-hmm. to the conclusion that they're not alive, that they're not not just alive, but that they are beings, that they are creative beings in their own in their own way, in their own yeah. uh, life or dog life or whatever the particular species is in their own way? Because yeah. they are. They are. I I totally agree. My dog, the not the stray dog, but my real dog, Tiki. Um, she has her own personality. There's, I've never met a dog like her. She like, she decides when she wants a snack. It could be in the middle of my meeting. And I mean, maybe this is bad parenting, (laughs) but (laughs) I don't know how to stop it because she knows where they are. And Mm -hmm. she is deliberate. Like she'll go to the snack counter and bark there. Mm -hmm. And then if I'm like in a meeting, I'll just, you know, shake my head at her and she's looking right at me. And then she'll come closer. She'll get on the chair. She's like a six pound dog. So Mm. she'll jump on the chair and then where she can look right into my eyes from across the room. (laughs) Right. And then she'll bark louder. And if I still don't listen to her and this has happened on our show where I've had to like take my, myself off screen because she'll come right up to my desk and start barking as loud as she can because Mm. she's demanding a snack. And she she does things like that all the time. She she thinks she's a farm dog, you know, like she wants to go outside and play. And there's a lot of things that are way bigger than her mm-hmm. out there. Like we have mm-hmm. eagles out here and owls and all sorts of wildlife. Like sure. she wouldn't she wouldn't make it too far right. on her own. Um, but yeah, she's got this wicked personality. She's she's her own person, that's for sure. It kind of reminds me of, of Joy because Joy will come to me in the middle of the night. I'm I'm asleep, right? Just dead to the world. And all of a sudden, I'll find myself coming awake with this wet nose poked into my face where he's basically saying, are you awake? Are you awake? If you're awake, it's time to feed me. But are you awake? <laughs> are you awake? <laughs> Tigger will dig at like my back or wherever if she wants to get under the cover she'll just like dig close to my face and i'm like what is happening and then i like open up the covers and she goes underneath and she'll lay with me and she's cute yeah but i mean that's that's kind of where we started with this conversation with this dog is that i'm having such a hard time letting it go because i do believe that that there is consciousness there. And I believe that they know what's going on. And I already feel awful that this dog was left, you know, to fend for herself and nobody to love her. And now that, you know, I, she's finally come up to me and allowed me to pet her and stuff like that. She doesn't want to leave me alone. Now she wants to be my dog. She picked me and it just breaks my heart that somebody treated her like that. They just left her. And I understand people are, going through a really hard time right oh, now. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, on the other side, people are selling dogs like her for seven, eight hundred thousand dollars. Like right. you it, it, give her away. Yeah. <laughs> give her away. Yeah. You know, it just doesn't well, I, I, I appreciate the story too because Joy was also a rescue. He showed up mm-hmm. at our door. And he yeah. was we learned later that he was abandoned by people who lived across the street from us when they were evicted from their house. Oh, in fact, he was one of four cats that were abandoned when they were evicted from their house. And, and the only part of it that I mean, I that part I got because I, I, I didn't know the family at all. We, we had no contact with them while they lived here. And when they when they were out, I, I kind of was aware. I wasn't aware that they were being evicted, but I was kind of aware there was something going on over there. But I had no idea what it was. The part that I didn't quite understand and still don't understand to this day is all four of these cats had been through a program run by the American Society for Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, the ASPCA. Uh, it, it's the uh, Capture, Neuter, Release program. It's a way of, of keeping the stray population down by making sure they're all fixed, they're all neutered, so that there is a continuous uh, generation of you know, generation after generation of strays being being generated, and all four of them had been through that program. The way we know that they've been through that program is apparently there, there's some debate as to whether this is actually a, a nice thing to do. But they 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 do what they call ear tipping. They 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 take a little bit out of the ear, and that's the indicator to everybody that this is an animal that's been through that program. Mm. I had no idea about that. My ex had no idea about that. Uh, but we found out when we took them 
to the local SPCA and ask them to get the cats fixed. And they say, well, you don't need to. They've already been fixed. <laughs> and oh, uh, by the way, Joy is not a, ma- uh, 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 a female. He's a male. So you might want to know that one too. <laughs> <laughs> oops. <laughs> yeah, oops, indeed. We kept the name anyway. But the, the point is they knew because the, the Capture News Release Program, that's not the exact name, but it's like that. Um, yeah. That program, the only way you can get an animal through that program is to get it through the local ASBCA, which uh-huh. means you have to apply for adoption and all that kind of stuff. It's a fairly simple process, but that's the only place you can get it, which means they knew where the shelter was. That's the part uh-huh. that I have trouble understanding. They knew where the shelter was. They knew that the shelter was there to take animals that were no longer wanted. Why didn't they take the animals to the shelter? I can't figure that part out. No, you have to be really emotionally distraught and messed up to make that decision. I guess. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. He just showed me a picture of um, a puppy that was found in a trash compactor at the dump. Ugh. Yeah. Like they, the guy went to move and saw something moving and was like, what's that? And went in and it was a little dog mm-hmm. and the, like they traced it back to, wherever whoever had like whatever dog had these puppies and obviously there was more than one puppy yeah but they couldn't find any of the other ones it's just like i i don't know it hurts my heart that there's this devaluation of i i would call it human life but like life in general like well clearly it starts with their own devaluation they're devaluing their own life otherwise they would be in that space in the first true yeah yeah yeah, it's just such a hard thing. And I mean, I'd probably have lots of animals. <laughs> My husband didn't stop me because every stray, I'd be like, I want to keep it. <laughs> <laughs> no, and this is the first time that we've ever had a stray out here. But, you know, I love animals. I think that they have been some of my greatest teachers over the years mm. being with animals. Well, one thing neither one of us should do is neither one of us should publish our our addresses because otherwise everybody's going to be dropping off all their strays. They're going to say, oh, well, Walt and Jody Little take it. That's right. Yeah, that's right. (laughs) Oh, you don't dare do that. (laughs) Oh, it's so true. Yeah. Uh, (laughs) I'll tell you, though, it really is fascinating to me to take what we talk about here about how everything that is, all, all energy is alive. And then apply it to an animal that you know and love. That's part of your life. Yeah. I mean, when I look at, at my cat and interact with him and so forth and think of him in those terms, it actually enhances the experience for me. I don't know if it does for you. Mm-hmm. But literally, it, does, it enhances it. It makes the experience so much bigger. Like, wow, this this guy is part of that eternal energy we talk about. Mm-hmm. Part of that oneness, if you go yeah. like one step further. Yeah. I don't know. For me, it opened up uh, like what felt like a conversation. And I, I feel like I used to have it when I was a kid. And maybe lots of kids are like this where they like talk to their animals or like, sure. you know, when they play, they're like pretending that they that the horse speaks or the dog speaks or, you know, whatever. Right. We have movies about that. Um, how, but how, many, it, how many films have we seen of little girls playing dress up tea party with their dog? Exactly. I mean, that, that, that's a common theme that happens. Yeah, a lot. absolutely. But it's, it's like the adult version of having that tea party conversation. Like I talk to my dog all the time and I know she knows what I'm saying. And I know like she'll, you know, walk in one direction, turn around and look at me and I'll know exactly what she wants. It's like, we're having a telepathic mm-hmm. conversation Mm-hmm. You know, and my husband thinks I'm crazy, but I feel it with this dog, the stray dog that came here. Like, that's probably why my heart breaks a little bit more is that I am really cognizant of that connection mm-hmm. that I have to all things yeah. and all people. So her heart's breaking a little and I feel that too. Um, horses, you know, mm-hmm. I can I can feel that. I've always felt their energy. Horses have been my biggest teacher of energy and how energy moves and how to. Yeah. I didn't know it, but I, I was learning from them because horses have giant guts. And so in all of us inside of our guts are energy receptor sites. 
So okay. we're constantly receiving energy from outside of ourselves. And that energy is the information of what is going on. So when it's a human being, whatever energy that they're putting forward, whether they're honest or dishonest or even know what it is that they're putting out there, your gut is receiving that information and then your body is interpreting it. But we've never been taught how to actually listen and interpret that information in an intelligent way. We've just kind of severed that energetic intelligence off. But with horses, because they have giant guts, their reaction is bigger than humans or dogs mm. or whatever, because that's one of their their main ways of processing information is through their gut because they're so big. So yeah. when a horse, when people say like horses can smell fear, it's not even really fear. It's that they're they're interpreting the energy that they're receiving from you. And most people, when they're afraid, especially with big animals like that, they try and hide it. Mm. And then a horse will actually have a visible reaction when you're being dishonest with your feelings. So you're afraid, but you're trying to hide that you're afraid, then they will react badly or like rear up or do something because you're not being authentic mm. and they can see that. And that means danger to them. So if well, you were just, it, really. I mean, that's exactly. what they in their gut. exactly. So yeah. if you were just honest with your fear and allowed it to present itself, they would have no problem with you. It'd be fine. But so working with horses my entire life, I was always, because I'm small, I'm five, five, I say five foot one, but I think that's with like my boots on or something. Like, <laughs> that's all right. We'll, we'll give you that one. I'm five foot one. Um, so I'm small. And like, we've always worked with horses that are, you know, not huge horses, not big thoroughbreds, but about 15 hands high, somewhere in there. So always bigger than me. And mm -hmm can, you know, really knock you over and hurt you. So I always had to be aware of what was going on. And I've, I've been kicked when I wasn't paying attention and, you know, head butted when I was, you know, not paying attention and stuff. So I had to learn how to sense horses and deal with them and stuff like that. I always had this natural knack, but it wasn't until I started studying energy that somebody gave me a book on horses that explained all of the stuff that I've just explained to you and then how they communicate with one another and how they're just really reacting to whether you're authentic or not and how we have the same capacity to do so. We just mm -hmm. don't, we don't know how to use it or we haven't been shown how to use it. Or well, we let it go dormant. Yeah. I think, I mean, we talk a lot about it being cut off, but I think that's really what it is. We just let it go dormant. We don't pay attention to it. Yeah. We ignore it. You ignore it, yeah. So yeah. If, you, if you ignore a skill, you're gonna, it's going to get rusty. I mean, that's just the way life works, right? Yeah, just like another language, I presume. You know, if you don't use that language, yeah. you know, it might still be somewhere in the recesses of your mind. I'm right. sure that it is, but <laughs> you don't even know how to access it or even know to access it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's but. true. It's also um, kind of a, an odd thing that we – we go through our lives able to cut ourselves off that way. And then some of us try to rediscover it. And in the process of trying to rediscover it, we think, well, that's not possible. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm speaking for myself, really. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm kind of speaking abstractly, but really I've been talking about my own experience. My own experience was for many, many years, I didn't think I had capabilities like what we talked about now. Mm -hmm. I didn't think any of that was available to me. I didn't think that, uh, uh, but even to the, to this day, I still feel in many ways I can't channel, I can't um, re receive psychic messages, and so well, actually I can. I, of course I you can. I haven't I haven't turned it into anything. I haven't developed it. I haven't worked on it. You know, but but like so many people, I marvel. Like when when you come in and you start uh, doing some channeling or even trans channeling, uh, I, how it easily just flows from you. And I think to myself, how does she do that? <laughs> <laughs> Practice, practice. <laughs> That's just it because I wasn't practicing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Everybody can do it. It's so, it's so interesting that we look at other people and and think that because I have obviously thought that that about other things too. You know, if mm -hmm. I wish I was this, that was something that I learned. You know, from my brother, I think one of the biggest learnings I had with him was I was always like, wow, he's just 
My brother is very charismatic. Like he was a rodeo clown. Everybody yeah. loves him. He's like the center of attention. And I always thought like he got all the good stuff. Mm -hmm. And I didn't, I didn't get any of that. Cause I just thought it was a, like a, this or that, like he could have those things, but I couldn't have them too. Right. But it wasn't until like, you know, my thirties, mid thirties that somebody had said to me, Oh my gosh, you're so much like, you know, your dad and your brother. And then okay. it dawned on me like, Oh, I am. I'm just like that too. Just because they are, doesn't mean that I am not. Yes. It's not one or the other, but right. I think it's just like developing those those skills and everybody has that skill of connection because again, it goes back to that oneness. We're all connected. So the message from the divine or like telepathic communication or receiving the energy, it's all within us because we're all connected. That topic of connection has been a big one for me lately. I've mentioned it a few times here on the show, um, but it's also been a big part of my everyday life. It's growing in my everyday life um and animals are one way that i experience it i mean obviously it's because i enjoy the cat around um so i'm experiencing it every single day even if i don't want to yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's right but that connection is powerful and and i'm really beginning to appreciate not beginning i i am past the beginning stage i mean i'm intermediately almost to advanced stage appreciating just how important connection Mm -hmm. Not just our connection to animals, but our connection to everything, our, our energetic connection to all that is. I, I, I don't know that I will ever totally grasp it, grok it, as the, the word is often used. But if I'll totally grasp just how much that connection is, how huge that connection is. At least mm -hmm. not, maybe I have to go through a few lifetimes before I do that. I don't know. But all I do know is that every day, every week, every year my appreciation for it keeps growing mm -hmm. my my sense of it keeps growing mm -hmm. I, I become more aware of it i become more in tune with it more in touch with it and and it's not always it's not always fun <laughs> yeah I mean, to give you an example I, i've mentioned a few times here on the program i've been dealing with um, some blood pressure issues so i did something i haven't done in years i i made a doctor's appointment which here in the U.S. is actually a lot harder than you would think, but that's another story. Um, I, I managed to find myself a primary care physician and hook up a two appointment, all that kind of stuff. And uh, by the way, uh, the, parenthetically, uh, I, I learned almost nothing from it, but that's another story for another time. Um, <laughs> what, I, <laughs> what, what I did learn was this. Um, first of all, I'm, I'm in excellent health, no shock, uh, but I'm in great health. The blood pressure issue that, I am all worked up about. The doctor has no concern for it at all. She says, no, your blood pressure is normal. My, my, I've been saying to her the same thing I've been saying to, to the others I've been talking to, the other doctors I've been talking to at various times. I understand that my blood pressure is normal by your standards for people my age. It's not normal for me. I'm used to like 20 points lower than what I'm experiencing yeah. right now. And I'm trying to handle that. I'm trying to figure out you know, what to do with that. Because it's and uncomfortable for you, right? It's like it's not. It is uncomfortable. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I totally get from that experience alone. I understand now how it is that you get the mindset of being old. That's where it comes from, from stuff like that, where, where you start to believe, well, that's just because you're you're getting up there. Uh, everything's bound to slow down a bit when you get up there in age. It's, you know, that, that kind of morbid philosophy, which is absolute nonsense. Agreed. Yeah. When. when a lot, I, and I, I keep trying to tell these doctors, and they, and they they just laugh it off. They don't, including this one that I just hooked up with. And she she's a very nice doctor. She's obviously very uh, skilled and so forth. But she just dismissed it. Uh, but what I was trying to say to her, and what I try to say to all of them is, my body's telling me something. Why isn't anybody listening? Why am yeah. I the only one who's listening? Yeah, and, and, and you don't know how, how to like decipher the code. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Exactly. Well, I, I know some of it because I can hear it. That, so I, that part of the code I got. It's the rest of the code that I'm still trying to figure out. Yeah. But the fact is, it's my energetic connection that's been developing over the years that makes me even aware in the first place that my body is trying to tell me something. Mm -hmm. 20 years ago, I'm not sure I would have drawn that conclusion. No. In fact, I'm kind of sure I would not have. Yeah. 
But today, because I have been giving a lot of attention to this, because of these conversations that I have with you, Joel, Anne Marie, and all the people who've been on the show, I'm very aware of it. And so my body is, I mean, it, it's trying to tell me there's something that's not right here, something you need to address. Yeah. Modern medicine either can't or won't help me with it. I think it's a combination, actually. Yeah. You can get into that if you like, but. <laughs> Totally good. <laughs> yeah, really good. Yes, we're good at that. We're good at rabbit holes around here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I also recognize and realize that it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity for me to learn and to increase my understanding of how that energy works, how my own energy works, and how that energy of mine interacts with the energy of all that is, that oneness that you were referring to a moment ago. Mm-hmm. So uh, I, I'm learning to treat this, well, not learning, I'm actually applying. I, I am treating this as an opportunity to practice some of the things we talk about here. And running into a lot of barriers doing it too. I, I've told you and I've told others that I've been experimenting with AI, artificial intelligence. Yeah. And it, it's cool stuff. It's very limited, but it's cool. Even in its limitation, it can do amazing things. Mm-hmm. I tried asking, uh, I think it was Gemini, uh, the, the one that Google puts out. I, I tried asking, okay, my doctor is unwilling to take take me beyond this one step. I mean, she gave me, I, I was asking for information. She says, well, you know, cut down on yourself, get enough exercise, do a lot of walking. Yeah, yeah, I'm doing all those things. What else can I do? That's all I got for you. So Nothing. You're so fine. I said, <laughs> so so I, I was saying to the AI, what else, you know, help speculate with me here. Right. What, what else can I do? And the AI, predictably, because it is a large language model, which means it's drawing from the prevalent, prevalent uh, opinions and beliefs and, and uh, knowledge and so forth of the human race, came back and said, well, that's a conversation you need to have with your doctor. And, and so I said to the AI, I had the conversation with my doctor. She won't tell me anymore. <laughs> Long story short, I went through like this exchange. I was basically kind of pushing back at what the AI responses were. And finally, I got the AI to start speculating what some possible ways of understanding what's going on might be. What might those methods be? What might those approaches be? Uh, A key portion of it for me is I experience it as uh, pressure in my head. And that's because the blood vessels, uh, especially at the surface of your head, are very, very small. And so as any kind of a blood pressure issue, I mean, mine's pretty minor by comparison to most people, but no matter what it is, as they start to uh, manifest themselves, you'll tend to feel them where the smallest blood vessels are, because that's where you're going to have the greatest, um, the greatest evidence of it, so to speak. Right. Uh, which we often experience as headaches. That, that's, what I, what, that's not the only reason for a headache. There are lots of reasons for a headache, but that's one of the reasons for a headache. So I'm, I'm interacting with my own headache, if you will, and I'm interacting with the AI saying, okay, let me, I want to try to understand more about this. I want to try to speculate on, you know, what kind of supplements could I do or are there foods that I could eat, all that kind of thing. And, and once I got the AI to get past that barrier of, well, if you have to talk to your doctor about this, I'm not here to give you medical advice and all this other stuff. It actually started to give me some really interesting ideas, give me things that have been touched upon by medical research, but the, the mainstream medical haven't come to any conclusions about it. So it, it's it's out there on the edges, so to speak. It's, it's yeah. the bleeding edge, the bleeding edge of medical yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, And I found some really interesting stuff, um, basic stuff that can actually, that potentially not act, no, there, there's no proof on this. Isn't Well, first of all, there's never any proof in science, but um, there, there, there's, <laughs> there's no consensus in the, in the medical community that yeah. this is actually going to make a difference. But there is at least some indication from some studies that this could make a difference, these various things. One of them is vitamin B6. Now, I couldn't even tell you, I, I barely know what vitamin B6 is. <laughs> but apparently yeah. it's one of a list of, of like about a dozen different fairly common things that can have a, a positive effect on blood pressure. 
and on a number of other things too, because it's, it's also vitamin. I mean, you know, how bad can a vitamin be? <laughs> it's it's good for you. That's why they're called vitamins, right? Because we like them. They're good for us. Yeah. Um, another one, magnesium. I never I've been heard. hearing lots about magnesium lately. Have you really? Yeah. Yes. Apparently, deodorant, like, wow. um, you use a ma magnesium flakes and then you put it in, um, uh, not diluted water uh or oh, there's a process with water and you heat it up anyway a type of water that takes out all the stuff oh look at that <laughs> yeah. um i can't i can't remember what it's called but a special type of water are you and, talking about distilled water yes thank you you know it's okay. sort of the d distilled water <laughs> um you take the two and you mix them together you dissolve the magnesium flakes and then you spray um the a magnesium that spray on your armpits i guess and really? it works for deodorant like the there's something going on that creates the smell like that your body isn't able to get the toxins out or something like that and the magnesium helps draw the toxins out so if you're really smelly um, even if you put magnesium spray on the bottom of your feet allegedly um it will help you not smell anymore Wow, that's pretty wild. I know. Yeah. yeah, magnesium flakes has been on my um my radar for a little while. I've been meaning to get them because I've been trying to, with all things um in my house, get away from chemicals, mm. essentially, like deodorant. Uh, like there's just the more I look, the more concerned I am with where we're headed with everything. And I think what, what you were just saying rings so true. Like, oh, you're just going to age and, you know, you're going to look worse and you're going to feel worse and you're going to blah, blah, blah. No, no, I refuse to. Um, but I think we are feeling worse as a society because of all the shit that we're consuming. It's in so many things like deodorant, like our detergents, like, shampoo like these are just simple things that people are using every day that are chocked full of chemicals that disrupt mm -hmm. that homeostasis within our body yeah that's true well uh, well let's also be honest i mean what, what also happens is we 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 go through this aging thing because we believe we're going to our belief right. is true yeah 100% and, and, and anybody who has ever had any doubt about that, just wait till you get older, you'll find out. <laughs> it, it, it hits you in the face. You find out at some point you, you start having to deal with, well, you're getting up there in years. That's why you're feeling with, you're dealing with whatever it is that you're dealing with. And that's where it really becomes, it becomes very real. It becomes very apparent, very immediate in your own life. Like, oh, this is what they're talking about. This is that mindset. And it's yes. a lot to push against. It's a lot to push away and say, no, I'm not buying into that. Yeah. Major it's effort. funny because that thought came to me, I don't know, maybe like a month ago or something. I was just reflecting on life and whatever. And and that thought of like, oh, when you're older, you'll you'll feel worse or you know, whatever. And I was thinking, I wonder what that point is that that you're older. What's that? It's self-justification. Yeah. I, I feel bad, so I need to justify it. Yeah, absolutely. But I was thinking about, like, at what age does that begin? And that thought just, you know, had popped into my head. And I was like, well, I wonder, you know, what, what age, like, when you're four, in your 40s, in your 30s, in your 20s. I don't know. I don't think it's in your 20s. But, like, does it happen when you're in your 50s? Like, when does this happen? And, and and then I just let the thought leave me. And then I had a friend, um, I was having coffee with her and she's a few years older than me. And she said, man, when I hit my mid thirties, like I really started to feel my age in my knees and in here and there. And I'm about to turn 39. Mm -hmm. And I was like, huh, that's interesting. I thought it was much older. <laughs> that I, you know, like I just assumed that it was maybe when I was 50, that's when I would start feeling these things that they call age and mm -hmm. and then she had said that and what's interesting is it obviously had some sort of effect because mm -hmm. since then i've been having this knee pain that it came out of nowhere i didn't hurt my knee 
I didn't overextend it. Like I wasn't working out. I didn't do anything. Just mm. all of a sudden, my knee, my right knee started to hurt. Yeah, and it hurts to like bend down all the way or mm. whatever. And I said, oh man, my knees really bug me. Yeah, that's, that's age. You're getting old, girl. Mm. And I yeah. was like, I am not. <laughs> I am not. I am aging backwards. I'm just aging backwards in all ways. And yeah. it's funny because to an it, like to a deep extent, when it comes to the way that I look, like my face, I feel that. I feel that I look a lot younger than I am. I always have. And I have this belief that I always will look a lot younger than my actual age. And so it applies to my face, but I'm realizing that I am still caught up in that mainstream thought or that societal thought when it comes to the rest of my body. Right. Yeah. So I'm working on that one because I'm way too young to have any problems. <laughs> yeah. Well, we all are. Yeah. I mean, I talk about age. I don't, I don't think there's any particular age when, when this kind of thing occurs. I mean, I, I started having a panic attack when I was 29, 20, 30. So, I mean, it doesn't make any difference what the number is. Yeah. The, 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 there's a prevalent theory that says that aging is an illness, it's a disease. Um, and I guess it depends on how you use the word aging, but the way I have to say the way the word is usually used, I think it kind of is a disease, really. Yeah. Because what, what is really happening there is they're saying, oh, you're aging as if it's a bad thing, meaning that you're going to fall apart and die and just be decrepit and so forth. Um, but that's a mindset. Absolutely. It doesn't yeah. mean that, that you'll never die. I'm not suggesting that you'll never die. I'm saying that the whole thing about it falling apart and becoming decrepit, that's the mindset that, that, that you don't have to have. Yeah. And I really believe that, that any of us can learn to reverse what society has taught us. And I, I've oh. run into that really hard in the last year. I, I think I've mentioned a few times um, I was in physical therapy since last May for a neuropathy in my right Achilles. And it was pretty, pretty painful. It was, I mean, I, I love to walk. I couldn't do my, my usual walks. I'd be you know, in agony after just a mile or two. Um, so I was going through the therapy. One of the things that I learned, and by the way, I just completed the therapy recently. So you know, I'm, I'm coming out the other side. But one of the things I learned along the way is that it's really hard to reverse those old patterns because the reason I had the neuropathy in the first place was because I had this, these mental states, if you will, that led me there. Mm -hmm. States that I didn't even know existed, that I didn't realize were going on that were actually contributing. I didn't know they were contributing to this, this overall belief in, oh, when you get older, your things are bound to slow down and all this. I, I didn't think I'd bought into it. I actually had. Yeah. And I found out that I had because I started trying to reverse that. I wasn't trying to reverse all of it. I was just trying to re reverse that one thing. And oh my God, that was hard to reverse. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I'm not 100% back. I'm about 95% back. And the next last 5% from what my therapist was telling me, it, it just takes a while because um, in, in the most optimal uh, healing state, that part of the body, the ankle, the Achilles and so forth, the, um, the, the, the tissue that's down there, not the bone tissue, but the, the more gelatinous type of tissue can take a year with optimal conditions to heal. Mm -hmm. And by optimal conditions, meaning you never injure it again, it always heals perfectly, which never, ever happens. Mm -hmm. You know, So to be 10 months into it and to have gotten to 95%, that's actually a big accomplishment. She, she, was, totally. she was often saying how that was like, I was like her star patient because I kept making all this progress. It really demonstrates for me how powerful that societal mindset is that we're all going to fall into that, that age related abyss, how powerful that is, and also how much it takes to stand against it and say, no, thank you. Well, I think that there is a lot that like, uh, like Abraham Hicks always talks about like the speeding train. There's yeah. a lot going in that direction wow. of like, 
even just in in the words that you were saying, it takes this long to heal this type of tissue and this and that. And, and how much of that is our belief system yes. versus what is really, truly possible? Like, and I've come up against this with the, fer the fertility side of things, like, mm -hmm. oh, doctors saying there's nothing you can do and, you know, whatever. And, and saying, no, I don't believe you. I, I believe that I can do this. Like I'm still working on that mindset, but there's so many little things that are going in this direction and you're trying to go in that direction. And it's, it's a big task. I, I get a really clear sense of it when I work with an AI. Mm -hmm. um, of course, the way that works these days is you, you uh, go to a web page normally or to an app in some cases, and you type something in and it types something back to you. And so you're having this typed conversation with the AI. And if you ask the AI about something related to medical stuff, it will always give you the official medical line because it is representing the summary of the body of human knowledge and the body, summary of the body of human knowledge has certain conclusions where medicine is concerned. So those are the opinions that it expresses. And it does so forcefully and factually, like, you know, this is what is true. This is what's false. And uh, anything beyond that, see your doctor. I mean, that's the standard line, right? Mm -hmm. It's a little experiment that I, I was doing because I realized, well, it's a computer and it's not a human being. And I decided to take the line, well, I'm not going to hurt its feelings. In fact, I even asked it, do you have feelings? And it said, no, I don't have feelings. I said, okay, then I can't hurt your feelings. That's cool. So I decided to be kind of rude, really. And tell it it was full of it. <laughs> <laughs> like, no, I, I don't accept what you're saying there. Uh, aren't you leaving out A, B, and C as possibilities and so forth? It was interesting how quickly, because it also is programmed to be there to be helpful to you. It's interesting to see how quickly it'll flip over and make the other side of the argument. Mm. So a yeah. moment ago, it was saying to you, to give you an example related to what I'm dealing with. Like I said, I was dealing with, and still I'm dealing with some pressure in my head because of those little small arteries. And, and, and med modern medicine has no solution for that. They, there, there is nothing that they know about that directly targets how you take that pressure off. You can take, you know, you can take an aspirin, you can take a Tylenol, that kind of thing. But there's nothing that will, that will eliminate the cause of that. So uh, according to the, the medical theory, as it's understood today, and that's what, the AI was spitting back to me. There is no way to fix that. It, it can't be fixed. And I kept going after it with, well, let's speculate that. Let, let's pretend that there might be a way to do that. If there was a way to do that, how could it be done? And it pushed back on me like three or four times on that one. I had, kept coming at it from a different angle each time, trying to find a new way in, you know. Ultimately, I got it to agree to give me some possible answers. And that's where it started giving me what I was telling you about, the magnesium, the B6. You know, and it gave me like 12, 14 of them. And you know where the source was for this? It was the what? National Institutes for Health website. It was the government website. What? <laughs> that was the source that the, that the AI finally went to to get these speculations. <laughs> wow. I <laughs> Oh, well, I had to laugh at that. I had to laugh at, at myself because I had originally bought in to the idea that what the AI was saying was true. And I had to laugh at, wow, how cool it is that I now know this thing that I believed and that so many other people believe is only true because I believe it. It's not true because it is factually, objectively 100% true. It's mm -hmm. true because I believe it. Mm -hmm. Boy, does that really bring home just how powerful belief is. 100%. <laughs> it's crazy. It's really crazy how powerful that is. It's all an illusion, and it's just what we believe. Yeah. <laughs> it's like yeah. the particle wave theory. <laughs> Slight <to> us. <laughs> oh, man. What is real? <laughs> Nothing. Um, yeah. It's, yeah. There's nothing like the the, the the double slip theory to really just mess up your your head, and that's kind of what you're alluding to. And yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And we're so incredibly powerful mm. beings, um, and we have no no clue how significant we are. I think we're we're 
just on the precipice of that. I think we're just starting to become aware, some of us anyway. Yeah. But we're, we're at least willing to entertain the idea, wow, we, we're probably pretty darn powerful. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but it's an uncomfortable, um, like, conversation and uncomfortable, yes. like, admittance of it because i think we've been taught for so long that like you're that's oh that's egotistical (laughs) like you can't be all these things and i don't know who says that but you know they say that (laughs) (laughs) them you know out there somewhere don't be too big you know somehow i think that the they is a myth I, i don't think they actually exist i don't think so either I don't think so either. But if they do exist, like if we think about contrast, this idea just dropped in, then the opposite also has to exist too. Like you can't have one without the other. So mm. we we have to be significant. If we've ever felt insignificant, the significance of us also exists inside of that same thought process. <laughs> It's almost as if existence is like reaching out through all of our experiences and saying, hey, pay attention. (laughs) Right? Yeah. And I mean, you were just talking about it a few minutes ago about being conscious of, you know, this connection that you have with the world, with yourself and, and all of that. Like this is a deeper layer of exactly that as you said this connection with yourself the universe is saying or your body is saying which is the universe which is all things you know listen you need to listen um and keep listening (laughs) i i occasionally have uh, i think we all do have these little conversations with ourselves and i I occasionally have have the conversation about what what would be my answer after my life is done and I am in some way challenged on the other side with, well, why didn't you just do it? Why didn't you just believe? Why didn't, why didn't you just go with it? And, and the, the answer is, is kind of a, a snarky answer. The answer that keeps coming to my mind is, yeah, you wouldn't ask that question if you lived it. <laughs> yeah. If you lived in that place, in that experiment. You you gotta be there. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, you gotta be there. It's a little bit harder than it looks on the screen. It really is. Yeah. (laughs) I mean, we here, you and I, we have very, very similar beliefs, very similar ideas about how the universe works. It's uncomfortable for us to talk about. I mean, we we've created like this little safety zone here where we can talk about it and where our listeners who are kind of on the same wave of life can talk about it too. But even there, it feels a little bit scary. It does. It feels like somebody is going to you know, be the keyboard warrior and <laughs> snap yeah. you down or something. You know, it feels, it, it, you know what? It reminds me of the way that I felt about, you know, my brother. You know, it's this false belief that we carry along that mm-hmm. if I am, then I am taking away from others. And that's yeah. how I looked at my brother. He was, therefore I cannot be. Mm-hmm. And that's not true. And yeah. I think it's that belief tearing out that belief that um, someone else's greatness does not equal, you know, you're less than, you know, you, everybody is great, period. Like both are true at the same time. Which ties us back, I think, to the original topic because the original topic was animals. Yeah. And you know, are they self-aware? We believe they are. Are they conscious? We believe they are. Are they energetic beings? We believe they are. Our interactions with them are how we begin to learn exactly what you just described. Yeah, that's what the, that's one of the biggest roles I think animals play in our lives. It's almost like they become the mirrors for us to practice in. Yeah. Hmm. Right, because because uh, like it, when you're a little bit of a uh, when you're when you're a little kid, you'll you, you'll play dress up, right, and, and then you look to see what you look like in the mirror, and, and you play into the mirror about you know what it is that you're trying to portray it's mm-hmm. almost like you're trying to convince yourself yeah well that's totally. what the, animals are doing. the animals are helping you to convince yourself yeah and be in the moment mm-hmm. and you know love unconditionally i think that's one of the most amazing things about pets 
you know, especially dogs. I'm sure yeah. cats are similar. I've just never really had cats, but yeah. <laughs> you know, just loving you mm-hmm. without having to do anything. <laughs> yeah. Really. Without, without transaction is what we're talking about. Exactly. Yeah. Just being. Which mm-hmm. by the way, I, I, I actually think is only one kind of love. What is often called unconditional, I think is the only kind of love. I don't think transactional love really qualifies as love. No. It's really, I don't know what to call it, but it's not love. It's something else. <laughs> It's not the same vibration. It's a much lower vibration. Yeah. Yeah. I think I think unconditional love is the authentic form of mm-hmm. love, mm-hmm. which is magnetic because there is it's raw and real and just all that it is, like all the light, all the dark, all the parts combined. Raw is a good word for it. Mm-hmm. Because there is a raw energy to it. Yeah, like this powerful magnitude. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Earlier today, I was watching, um, I I don't watch a lot of television, but lately I've I've watched more than I usually do. Um, I I think I was on Hulu channel and I picked up this documentary about a group that's investigating the uh, theories of Nikola Tesla. Really interesting, really interesting what these people are doing. One of the experiments that they did, and it, it'll be evident in a moment why I'm bringing this in, but one of the experiments, experiments they did is you know, Tesla talked about how the Earth could actually be a generator of electricity that could fuel that, that could basically fuel our, our entire civilization. And, and one of his dreams was that that would happen. Well, his basic experiment is based on on the idea that there is an energy that flows through the earth that also interacts with the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And he actually developed this theory before the idea of the ionosphere was created, but it was the ionosphere that was, he was, his theory was, that's where the interaction was taking place between that and the ground. Well, these researchers took the basic idea. They they created what's known as a Tesla coil. It's basically a copper coil. They put, took two of them, put them on little sticks to make towers out of them. The sticks, the, uh, the towers rather, are connecting through the atmosphere. You can't really see it, but it, I mean, they're, you can see the two of them standing there. And they're both connected to the ground. So they create a circuit through the ground, up through the towers, through the atmosphere, back down to the ground. So they have this complete circuit going. And then they plug something into that circuit. Like in this case, I think it was a electric, uh, you know, motorized boat, like a toy boat. And they were able to power this boat riding around a lake off of this circuit that was just drawing energy from the earth. <laughs> How did they plug it into it? Oh, I need this documentary in my life. <laughs> I'll send you the link to it. No, yes, um, please. Li- li- literally they, they, they had a, um, let's see, how did they do it? They had a coil, I think on the boat itself. And so the, the coil was part of that circuit. And, and it was, and, and one of the interesting things, this is really fascinating. They, they had these two towers and what they found is they, they had the two towers, something like, I don't know, hundred feet apart, something like that. And they, they got an electronic device on there to measure the current and the, and the, the voltage and the wattage and all that kind of stuff. And the current was off the scale. It was this really high current. It wasn't a lot of voltage. Um, so it wasn't a huge amount of wattage, but the current was off the scale. They said, well, we put that, if we, if we put that current into that, toy boat is going to blow the boat up it's going to break the damn thing so they actually had to move the towers apart in order to bring the current down so they could control the thing. wow it was really something but they but they did it they they first they they did the experiment the way tesla did it they actually got a hold of, of one of the old light bulbs from the 1920s that he used with his experiments and and they were able to light the light bulb using this circuit setup and then they connected it into the boat and then they had the boat driving around uh, the lake with radio control. And, you know, so they, they're, they were showing how this stuff works. Yeah. But it, it's, it's really cool because, well, for a number of different reasons, it's really cool. For me, the biggest part that was cool about it is that it illustrated all these, these interesting ways that energy works that we don't even know about. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and I think it's important to remember Electricity is just one form of energy. I, I think that all energy falls into the category of what we would call spiritual energy. 
Yeah. But real energy, real electricity is part of that, that continuum. Yeah. I mean, the, yeah. the electromagnetic spectrum, that to me, the, the electromagnetic spectrum is one piece of the overall energy field. It's the part that we know how to interact with. It's the part that drives our society. It drives our electronics. It drives our internet. It drives all the stuff that we know. Um, but it's not the only form of energy. It's just that that's the only part we've learned how to interact with. Mm-hmm. And here we I here agree. We're, we're watching on, on the TV. I was watching these guys who were interacting with this energy that was just built into the earth. I thought, that's so freaking cool. Can you imagine? Fascinating. Can you imagine if, I, I still don't understand why nobody's just grabbed this. Because I mean, the patents expired on this years ago. You know, the pat, patents only last, but even then, they only lasted about what twenty eight years, something like that. You know, Tesla died in nineteen forty two, I think it was. It's been a while, <laughs> forty three, something like that. You know, so, so these patents are long since expired. Anybody could build these things. You know, I'm wondering what's it going to take for somebody to say, you know what, I'm going to build a bunch of these things. Let's see if we can create a, a power structure. You know what? This is my um, conspiracy side of my brain thinking and maybe maybe some other parts too. But I think it comes down to um, belief systems again. Yes. Because our belief system is that this is how power is generated and power works. You have power lines that connect to homes and then you plug it in and you got lines in your house and that's the light bulb. Woo. Yay. Like there's just, there's no and, and, and way. They're driven. they're driven by, you know, you, you burn oil, you, you burn uh, exactly. various kinds, well, you have solar panels, you have wind power, you have stuff that has to drive all this stuff. Yeah. But most people don't even understand that side no. of things. And I know this very well because of, you know, I live in Alberta and there's a huge drive in Canada for environmental sustainability, which I understand. Um, but the, it's not a place where we could sustain our entire power grid on solar. Um, and they don't want to use coal anymore and they don't want to use natural gas. But We don't have another option for the base power load that we need. And people just can't compute that. But I think it, like coming back to the Tesla stuff, people aren't trying this because, well, if it worked, quote unquote, then they would have done it long ago. If we could have free yeah. energy, they would have. But yeah, the yeah. conspiracy part of my brain is, no, they wouldn't have. No. You know how much money they would have lost over the last how many years not having like the copper, the wire, like all of these things, the infrastructure that they built, nor did they want to put money time energy into figuring it out now they're kind of like shooting themselves in the foot <laughs> if they were to do that so well, i well, think it's also that day again i mean the day in this case well, you're, yeah. you're, you're describing the day in terms of the people who are the the owners of, of the energy infrastructure but it's not right. just they're not the only they there's no. also the day of the of the uh the environmentalists who are much more interested in pushing a political agenda than they are in actually building a tesla coil right I mean, Really, it's pretty straightforward. You 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 want to do something to change the energy infrastructure? You build some Tesla coils, and you start testing and experimenting, and see if you can build up a network. I mean, it's like the energy is right there. That's right. It's, it's there. Crazy. It's already here. It's funny because I watched I watched a, a, a series of videos. Um, it was I it was on a, a bunch of different things, but they were talking about free energy systems. And I for I watched this in 2001. And since then, I've been like, Nate, you got to watch it because I don't understand this. And he's an electrician. So he understands all the words that they're using. And I'm like lost. Mm -hmm. But they're talking about in this video series that there's these old magnificent buildings. And a lot of times we look at them and they're churches and mm -hmm. they're government buildings. Mm -hmm. um, but they're like just extraordinarily beautiful. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of times when you look at an aerial view, they have these massive ponds around them and they are symmetrical, like pointed in certain directions, you know, whatever. They had these windows. We look at them and we're like beautiful stained glass windows. But what this documentary was saying, and I don't know, I don't know anything about it. I have done no research beyond this, but was talking about how this was an energy system. They used water. They used the organs. Um, they used these windows. They weren't windows. They were just patterns to collect and connect and harvest energy from the ether. Interesting. I, I, Very I have interesting. No of it. I have no knowledge of that at all. Yeah. It makes sense. I mean, like, 
to me, like watching that video, I'm like, huh, it is interesting why they have these huge caverns underneath these buildings, um, why they have these weird, weird shaped windows, like, and, and it, we don't have those things today. I, mm -hmm. I mean, we're all about like efficiency now. So now we have buildings that are straight up and down and really boring and whatever. And maybe that's the reason, but yeah, I think that there's something to it that there was free energy or they had mastered something or something. That's the conspiracy side of me talking. But I think you hit the nail on the head when you said, you know, we should be testing these things. We want to do something different for energy. Why not look at these things? I mean, I, I look at this, this series I've been watching and I think to myself, these guys are making these really cool documentaries, you know, and, and they're presenting, by the way, they're presenting them as conspiracy theories because yeah. the theory is, well, the government took all this information and hid it away and put it into the defense industry. And, you know, the, the oil companies didn't want to have it. So they shut it down. They, they, they don't actually say that they allude because that's what you do with the conspiracy. Theory. Yeah. You allude, yeah. You allude to it all. Yeah. You hint that, well, oh, that's really, you know, nudge, nudge, wink, wink. That's what's really going on here. Yeah. And all I can think of I'm watching this is, so when are you guys going to build a Tesla infrastructure? You know, yeah. you're putting all this energy into building up these conspiracy theories. Why not just build the damn infrastructure? <laughs> you guys, I, I, and they have all the people to do this. They've got electricians. They've got, they got astrophysicists. They've got people who understand how all this stuff works, working on the project. But their belief system says, no, we got to work on promoting the, the conspiracy theory. We got to build the sensationalism so we can sell a video. Yeah, you know? no. It, but we're not like, changing anything right in the world by doing right that. It's like right there. Yeah. All we got to do is say, well, hey, well, we build a bunch of Tesla towers. But they aren't doing that. Why? Their belief structure won't let them do that. Exactly. Yeah. Well, I think it's hopefully somebody takes that and runs with it, though, and starts yeah. to do it. Like, wouldn't that be cool if people started to do that on their own? And, yeah. you know, I'm not a huge fan of solar because of the, the of what it takes to build the solar panel is very destructive. And here it doesn't work that well. I'm sure there's places in the world that it's like beautiful. Yeah, it's going to work really well. It's gonna yeah, exactly. But, you know, <laughs> when we have winter a lot of the year <laughs> and it's not a lot of light, it just doesn't. It doesn't work. They're not rated to work as well here. It's just not. It's not a. It's not as sustainable as it would be in other parts of the world. Yeah. But I mean, Tesla coil. But Tesla coil. I mean, the sure. ether doesn't go away because it's no, winter. It yeah. So yeah, it's, it's maybe we build one on Craven Farms. Yeah. I'm gonna get Nate on it now. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, instead of running a power cable out to the greenhouses, we're going to do a Tesla coil. <laughs> uh, can you imagine, though, if we start, you know, having, we have the farm, uh, the um, farm table dinners and like the, the greenhouse with all the food in it and stuff like that, like a market garden business. Imagine if all of it is, is uh, powered by a Tesla coil. And, and by the way, I, I really should be fair here. There, there is a lot of need to do the research on it. I mean, when, yeah. when Henry Ford first built his first car, he, first of all, he wasn't the first car manufacturer. And second of all, he had to build a whole assembly line in order to make the thing happen. He had to, he had to invent the assembly line in order to build his car. There, mm -hmm. There's a lot of engineering that goes into making something like this work. So we know that a Tesla coil works. Does that mean we have an infrastructure? No, you have to learn how to build it. You have to learn how the thing works. You have to experiment with it. You have to play with it. Yeah. There's a whole series of things you have to go through there. But the first yeah. thing you have to do is take the first step. That's what we're looking for. We're That's looking right. for someone to just take the first step and say, well, shoot, I'm, I, I can take a swing at this. Let's go for it. Yeah. Let's see what we can do. Exactly. Yeah. Isn't that, though, what life is all about in this entire conversation about oh, yeah. taking the first step to realize that there is oneness, taking that yes. first step to really connect with all that is surrounding you and all within you? I'm it's reminded of a song that was popular among peaceniks when I was growing up. And it still has some popularity today. Um, the, the lyric of the song always was, was framed to, to have a certain meaning to it. But I always turn the meaning around in my mind and you'll know exactly what I mean when I say it. The lyric is, let there be peace on earth and let it begin with me. And the part that always read people, most people would hear, let there be peace on earth. That's not the part I heard. The part I heard was, let it begin with me. 
Yes. Because all, not just peace, everything begins with me. That's right. That's the part I needed to learn. Yeah. It, no matter what it is, it begins with me. So when I say let it begin with me, I mean literally let it all begin with me. Let the belief begin with me. Let the, the changing of my belief about aging begin with me. Let my belief about my blood pressure and how it can be shifted begin with me. Let my belief about Tesla and Tesla coils, let it begin with me. Let my belief about how energy works believe, begin with me. That's the, And by the way, peace will come when you do that. But that's not the big part. The big part is let me be, let, let it begin with me. Yeah. That's a perfect ending. <laughs> I, think I so. can't <laughs> add any more. <laughs> and that's a rare thing, folks, because when you <laughs> find a way to pull it together, you know we've hit the, the mark. We've hit the <laughs> just left us speechless. <laughs> yeah. There's nothing more to say. Just let it begin with me. Let it begin with me. Yeah. Love it. Well, I'm sorry our guests couldn't make it today, but I'm kind of not because this is fun. Yeah. <laughs> me either. This is a good conversation. I mean, we started yeah. with pets, we started with animals. We got yeah. the energy and we tied it all together. That's a good day's work, I would say. I'm, I feel good Absolutely. About it. it was perfect. <laughs> so thank you very much. I look forward to having our guests next week, but I'm glad we got to do this one this week. Thank you to our podcast listeners everywhere. We'll see you all next time here on LOA Today. Goodbye, everybody. <laughs>